She's already gone, um, but she was part of this whole group that began. And if Mary had been here, Mary is probably coming from church, I don't know. But there are others here who have been at the original, I was at that original time. We had all sorts of, his hands up, all sorts of doves and balloons and things. This is 1993, not 1993. <laughs> <laughs> She gave this to us and it survived the earthquake. A wall fell on us, but it came up and it was it's called the wedding, it's golden wedding. So she gave it to me on my our golden wedding. Um, but it survived. So I bring this in remembrance of Veronica and Molly and the other person who was here was Kat Tissa. Mm. She actually unveiled it as well. And you've got to all read what's actually there. I've suggested to the City Council that this is an important site. Oh, here's Ruth. Um, acknowledge and Ruth Megan. and Megan. Um, and Helene. We've got other City Council people. Ellie Jones. Yeah. 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 You don't look like a City Councillor today. <laughs> That's fine. So we acknowledge all these special people who are here and thank the St Andrews Piper for doing this, but Katie, who's going to speak after Camellia. So I'll pass it over to you with your Camellia. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Chris. It's great that you found the Camellia for today. Um, thank you, Margaret, and uh, also thank you, Karina, uh, <laughs> Chair of the Kate Shepherd Memorial Trust, um, and also Lynette, who's really gone to a lot of effort to uh, make this happen. Um, Lynette was the one that, that actually originally uh, sent a, a, an email trail around sort of saying can't we get together and liberate the Cape Shepherd National Memorial and I think the point was made was that it was a national memorial and that's what makes it so um, vitally important uh, that it was liberated and a lot of buildings of course got um, completely tied up in what's called a fall zone I don't know if anyone had heard of a fall zone before um, February 2011 but uh, the fall zone was was um, was the reason why it was blocked off, and so when Lynette first um, sent the email, uh, we got in touch with the right uh, department within the city council and said, "Is it possible to make this happen?" And uh, we determined a, an appropriate date uh, would be uh, March the 8th, International Women's Day, and um, you might remember that on March the 5th we had a rather large. Um, 
silver vent. In fact, uh, <laughs> the largest amount of rainfall in decades, you know, over a very short period of time. And that put a huge amount of pressure on that particular department. And so we said, look, lighten the load, make sure that you've got your focus on the other things, but they still got it cleaned up and ready to go. But we weren't, um, we weren't able to really commit with the flood that came right the way through. I think some of you have seen the photographs of how the waters came right through um, into this area. So it's great to be able to find another date. Um, and so this will be an important date for us to remember. Um, the 8th of June uh, is a date that we've all gathered here today to liberate uh, this particular memorial. And as we've heard, Dame Catherine Tizard, I think our first woman Governor General, uh, appropriately um, unveiled the the original um, uh, uh, unveiled it originally on September the 19th, 1993, as the centennial um, celebration. This was commissioned by Women Towards 2000 and sculpted by. Now I'm I'm just going to do the name here. I haven't um, met her, so. Marguerite Windhausen, is that? Yeah, but is that the correct pronunciation? So, um, and uh, and again, a, a wonderful relief. So, I'm going to um, introduce you to the to the women on the memorial. So, um, because of course we all know Kate Shepherd, um, but the other women are equally important because they represent different parts of the whole movement. So, this is um, Mary Tetai Mangakahia of Tai Tai Tokoro, who requested the vote for women from the Kotahi Tanga Māori Parliament. So she had a very important role in our history. Um, Amy Daldi, a foundation member of the Auckland uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union and president of the Auckland Franchise League. Um, Kate Shepherd of Christchurch, as we know, the leader of the suffrage campaign. Um, and uh, Ada Wells, also of Christchurch, who campaigned vigorously for equal educational opportunities for girls and women. Uh, Helen Nicole, who pioneered the women's franchise campaign in Dunedin. And another Dunedinite, Harriet Morrison, uh, Vice President of the Tayloresses Union and a powerful advocate for working women. So um, aren't they a wonderful combination? I think they were selected in order to give that flavour um, of all elements that came together to make this happen. And as you've heard, the history's um, um, inscribed on the panel, so I won't read them all out, but I've made some notes from them so that uh, we can just, just touch on the highlights. So on the 19th of September, 1893, New Zealand women won an historic victory, the right to vote in parliamentary elections. New Zealand became the first self-governing country in the world to recognise this freedom for all women. Um, and in 1870, 1887, Kate Shepherd of Christchurch was appointed superintendent of the franchise department of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and led an intensive seven year campaign. And I thought that was a great um, story too, the fact that this wasn't something that just happened overnight. It was an extensive campaign. And of course she inspired many women to join this cause of liberty and justice, and these are the words. Now this is not um, inscribed on the panels, but I thought I'd read out the pamphlet that she wrote um, in 1888, which set out the 10 reasons to give women the vote. Now some of the party politicians won't like um, some of her ideas of the time, but, um, <coughs> but I thought that they were worthy of reading out on this auspicious occasion. Because a democratic government like that of New Zealand already admits the great principle that every adult person not convicted of crime nor suspected of lunacy has an inherent right to a voice in the construction of laws which we must all obey. Two, because it has not yet been proved that the intelligence of women is only equal to that of children nor that their social status is on a par with that of lunatics or convicts. Three, because women are affected by the prosperity of the colony, are concerned in the preservation of its liberty and free institutions and suffer equally with men from all national errors and mistakes. Because women are less accessible than men to most of the debasing influences now brought to bear upon elections, and by doubling the number of electors to be dealt with, 
women would make bribery and corruption less effective as well as more difficult. <laughs> because in the quietude of home, women are less liable than men to be swayed by mere party feeling and are inclined to attach great value to uprightness and rectitude of life in a candidate. <laughs> but I think Megan and Ruth are okay in that regard. <laughs> Um, because the presence of women at the polling booth would have a refining and purifying effect. <laughs> because the votes of women would add weight and power to the more settled and responsible communities. Because women are endowed with a more constant solicitude for the welfare of the rising generations, thus giving them a more far-reaching concern for something beyond the present moment. I love that one. <laughs> because the admitted physical weakness of women disposes them to exercise more habitual caution and to feel a deeper interest in the constant preservation of peace, law and order, and especially in the supremacy of right over might. And finally, because women naturally view each question from a somewhat different standpoint to men so that whilst their interests, aims and objects would be very generally the same, they would often see what men had overlooked and thus add a new security against any partial or one-sided legislation. <laughs> so there are the ten reasons why women should have the right to vote, as written in 1888. So opposition was, was pretty fierce, um, you might imagine, at the time. The campaign produced three major petitions, 1891, 1892, and of course the one we all know in 1893, that one with 31,872 signatures. Could you imagine getting a, a petition of 31,872 signatures today, even with the benefits of social media? Um, hard to sort of challenge up that number of um, signatures, but you know, it was the largest ever gathered in Australasia, and it was you know done by bicycle and door knocking, and um, you know, it was just really um, quite a different um, kettle of fish. Um, a leading suffrage supporter, Sir John Hall, presented the 1893 petition to Parliament during the debate on the electoral bill. The bill giving women the vote was finally passed with a majority of two. <laughs> Um, and of course women rejoiced in their hard won victory and it actually wasn't, it, it was extraordinary really because they got on the roll, the election was two months after the law was changed and yet 70% exercised their new right to vote. So it was an extraordinary time. Um, so. Um, and after the vote was won, uh, a Women's Christian Temperance Union um, Union editor wrote, and this is um, on here as well, we the mothers of the present need to impress upon our children's minds how the women of the past wrestled and fought, suffered and wept, prayed and believed, agonised and won for them the freedom they enjoy today. And I think that's really probably the most important message that we can um, take um, from today. And today is an opportunity to give thanks to Kate Shepherd and her fellow suffragists who have helped define our city's place in our nation's history. It is not surprising that Christchurch went on to, to produce the first woman MP, Elizabeth McCombs, and the first woman cabinet minister, um, Mabel Howard. Um, although it's not without its challenges, New Zealand's journey to uh, universal suffrage was essentially dignified, peaceful and democratic, which can be contrasted with the distress and the violence and disruption which characterised the change in the United Kingdom. And I think it's on that note that I think we could issue a challenge today to build on the lessons we've learned as a city as a result of our recent experience along with this history. Uh, when I left Parliament, my staff gave me this um, necklace, and some of you will have heard me comment about it before. Um, the, the, the big um, bead says, the most courageous act is still to think for yourself, aloud. Um, yeah, very, very important quote from um, Coco Chanel. Um, <laughs> and that usually gets love. But, uh, I mean, it, but the point is, is that it's, a, it, it's so true. Sometimes having the courage to say what's on your mind, to speak out, even if it is against what um, the mores of the time might be, it's really important that people do have the courage to speak uh, um, and to, well, to think for themselves and to speak um, that, that thought um, aloud. 
Um, the three smaller beads speak to community resilience and leadership and I've often said that I didn't really understand what those those words truly meant until the experience that we've been through. Um, the community is not a co-location of houses, that's a suburb. Um, it's the relationship between those um, people and it's also their relationship with the decision makers. That's what makes um, community, that's what social capital um, is based on. Resilience is not strong in the face of adversity, that's, um, that's stoicism, which we're well known for here in Canterbury. Um, but it's actually a lot more, it's about the capacity to plan and prepare for adversity, but it's also about how we come together, how we absorb the impact, how we recover quickly, how we, um, how we have the ability as a community to thrive in the face of adversity, and I think that's a component of resilience that I hadn't really understood before. It's the capacity to adapt to something that's really quite different um, from what we've been used to. Um, it's the opportunity to co-create a new kind of normal and it's that concept of co-creation that, that gets me excited about the participatory democracy we could be here in Christchurch building on the history of what we've had um, in the past. So I think that um, in a, in a um, and leadership is not a position you hold, it's a mark of character and I've been thinking about the kinds of words that um, that these women leaders inspire, uh, and they're very much uh, words that inspire us, I think, today in a post-recovery environment. And they are respectful, engaging, empathetic, inclusive, and intuitive. And I don't know about you, but I always think of women when I think of those, those words, not, not, not exclusively. But I think we've had that image of the heroic leader Built, um, built up as the sort of command and control and the sort of top-down approach that really um, doesn't see that true leadership comes from from within and, and alongside and, and working with people in a, in a partnership way that build enduring relationships and trust. When we're defining who we are as a city and a province, we can claim to be the birthplace of the movement that means our country was the first to give women the right to vote. But there is an important point to be made about how we got there. Um, and others have said this too. Organisation on the ground was important, but so was the dignity and determination that characterised the way these women leaders negotiated with the political leaders of the day. After all, it was men who had to cast their vote for women to get their right to cast their vote. The Christchurch Times reported Kate Shepherd's death in simple appreciation. A great woman has gone, whose name will remain an inspiration to the daughters of New Zealand while our history endures. So let us be, um, continue to be inspired by their, their leadership, their um, relentless determination and courage as we seek to define a new future for our city. Releasing this memorial today, liberating our memorial today, becomes a symbol of our rebirth as a city and of a positive and just future through cooperation um, bringing, bringing on change. So thank you very much for turning up today. It's a wonderful celebration. <laughs>
and we don't want it. War never determines who is right, only who is left. So clearly, it's not the way to solve an argument. Now, I ask you to take a moment to think carefully about conflict today. What countries spring to mind? Personally, for me, I think of Afghanistan and Iraq. Apart from being war zones, what do these countries have in common? They're both in the Middle East, they're both predominantly Islamic, they are both filled with women who are almost entirely uneducated. I believe educating these women is the key to peace in these countries. Education is essential to the maintenance of peace. It's supposed to grow and develop our children into problem solvers and leaders and everything we need to build strong future governments. But when you only educate half of your children's leaders, creates a huge imbalance within your future governments and thus educating women is the key to maintaining peace. In Afghanistan only 15% of women can read and write. One woman for every five men receives tertiary education and in Iraq it's three for every five. Here we're seeing huge amounts of leadership potential go completely to waste. Without an education the values and perspectives of these young girls aren't developed and they don't have the confidence to speak out and share their ideas for a better world because they are left thinking they are stupid. We only need to look at examples such as Malala Yousafzai to realise the wasted potential. She is one of the lucky girls who received an education. And look at her now. Only 16 and she's a worldwide advocate for peace, equality and most importantly, education. Malala once so beautifully said, My goal is not to get the Nobel Peace Prize. My goal is to get peace. And my goal is to see the education of every child. She epitomises selflessness and wisdom, things that are essential to a peaceful country. What a wonderful leader she will be. Sadly though, we can't expect to see many leaders like her if an effort is not made to educate more Afghani and Iraqi girls. There is plenty of evidence to show that women are underrepresented in the workforce and the government in Afghanistan and Iraq. In Afghanistan, women make up about 27.6% of parliament. These women, however, have literally no credibility within these specialist areas of work. They are there because they are required by law to be, not because they are valued. In Iraq, it's even worse. Women make up 2% of the private sector, and even though Article 47 of the Iraqi Constitution clearly states that 25% of council representatives have to be women, there is one singular female minister out of 44 men. So why aren't women making it into these powerful roles? Partly because of the same prejudice that denies them education, but largely because they didn't receive that education in the first place. How can we expect women to use their leadership potential and spread their ideas for peace like Malala when they are denied the same basic rights to education that men receive? And it's not just a woman's right to education that is undermined, it's her potential skills to incite change. How many of you here today would happily raise your hands in agreement if I said women and men are the same? <laughs> None of you. <laughs> because women are different, and that's a really good thing. We have different values and perspectives, and we see the world in an entirely different way. I believe getting women into government in Afghanistan and Iraq would massively shake up how those countries are run and ultimately bring peace. Now, throughout the duration of my speech, I'm sure many of you have been thinking, okay, well isn't this a bit sexist? What makes you think women are going to maintain peace? What can a woman bring to the table that a man can't? Well, sorry, but here's the proof. But first, a warning. The things I'm about to say may shock, so I ask specifically all the men here to relax and please try not to take it too hard. 
women have better brains than men. <laughs> sure, men's brains have their merits, but when it comes to the best brain for peaceful leadership, the woman's brain wins hands down. In a man, the right cerebral hemisphere is larger than the left. This, along with testosterone, makes men more aggressive and more impulsive. When challenged, they find it hard to see any resolution except violence. In a woman's brain, however, the two cerebral hemispheres are perfectly symmetrical, meaning not only are we less aggressive and less impulsive, but our two cerebral hemispheres are able to communicate more easily, giving us greater ability to communicate and process words. Women have a larger frontal cortex and limbic cortex, meaning we are better able to take into consideration emotions while men tend to overlook them. Women problem solve through teamwork while men problem solve alone. And women are biologically wired to avoid conflict. Now, wouldn't you all agree that these sound like the qualities for wise leaders? Leaders with empathy, leaders who are open-minded, leaders who understand their people, leaders who achieve peace with intellect and not violence. It is absurd that Iraq and Afghanistan deny their women of a right to education when they have the opportunity to grow and nurture a whole army of women who solve conflict with their minds as opposed to their might. Sorry boys, but girls win this round. So, education and the maintenance of peace. What is to be done? Quite simply, educate women. A woman's brain is invaluable in a leadership role. Iraq and Afghanistan are leaving their girls behind. They're not educated and they're virtually non-existent within the government. As a result, their government lacks non-violent ideas for peace because men seem to choose to repeat history rather than look to new ideas. A woman's calm, caring and thoughtful voice is desperately needed within these countries but it's not going to be heard unless we do something to ensure their educational rights are met. We all need to be standing up and saying, hey, we believe in female education. We believe in the power of women. We believe in their rights. We need to give overwhelming support to activists like Malala, encourage them to learn and get into power one day. The world needs to stop sending troops over and start sending glorious, educated women. Because war does not determine who is right, only who is left. I want to say a very special thank you to Katie uh, for sharing that winning speech from the United Nations. It was a national one and we can understand why. Well done and we are looking forward to seeing what you do in the future with your career. <laughs> I think Leanne's taking notes as well. <laughs> so thank, you, so thank you very much. The next thing says we've got to give Mayor Leanne a flat. And the reason is that we're very grateful to her, A, for being who she is, and secondly, for being our Mayor. And she has graciously considered that the Canterbury Women's Club who got together this idea, she could be a patron of. Now, patronage is very difficult for women, so I've said she can be whatever kind of patron she likes. <laughs> um, Leanne, this is for you. And we will put another one up on a wall of our, what is at the moment, uh, just a room really, um, in the city. But thank you, Leanne. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. Um, I think we're allowed to put our flowers on the river. We're going to do something that's probably not allowed, but we're going to go on the landing <laughs> <laughs> out there. But what, what, what Easier to is... ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't got flowers, there's plenty here. We brought um, some buds for the young people and we brought some older flowers that are going into um, the, they're dropping their leaves because we're getting tired so we need the young ones to take over and the buds and all the flowers are for putting in the river if you'd like they're roses not 
camellias because it's not the right time. And I live up the hill, so the wind's blown a lot of the leaves away, but there's a few petals there if anyone just wants to put petals in. You want well, to be the first? Well, no, I'm going to put my camellia on here because I, because I think the camellia should stay here. Yes. So you can take some roses. I will. I'll go with them. Well, and, and does others want to come down to the, the forbidden landing? And we'll put the roses in. I'm just going to go down there and video them as they walk down. So many roles. <laughs> Is that the landing over Yeah, yeah. So is the piper going to pipe us down? Yeah, we've been packed. Oh my 
my god! <laughs> Small brains. <laughs> right. Hey, how are you going? Hey, how are Maybe. <laughs> oh, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>